Thank you for staying tuned. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. This is the commentary to Parashat Ekev. And if you've got the written notes, we're near the bottom of page three. We've been talking about holiness and how that God saves a person through the sacrifice of his son Yeshua. And we know, we affirm that this is the only way that a person can come to the Father. This regeneration takes place firstly from the inside. The heart of the individual is changed. And we call that righteousness. But what we also need to be challenged with is that righteousness is a duty. And we left off in part A with the question, um, what do we mean by the term righteousness or holiness as a duty? So let's pick up um, the commentary reading at the bottom of page 3 and answer the question that I asked. What do I mean by holiness being a duty? Well, apart from being an attribute of God, holiness is one of God's attributes. And and this holiness, again, is conferred to us. It's, one that it, it's a quality. Um, it's an attribute that we, believers, inherit intrinsically with our trusting faithfulness in the Messiah. Okay, that, that's true. But holiness is also meant to be a lifestyle. Now, this is why I keep using the phrase trusting faithfulness. I picked that up from David Stern. Trusting faithfulness has a kind of a different nuance when we compare it to the word faith. Now I'm going to I'm going to exercise I'm going to show this to you here in my commentary and I'm going to do it using um, some colored words. If you have the commentary and you've printed it out in a color printer, you'll see that on the bottom of page 3 and the top of page 4 um, the words trusting faithfulness and faith and such are going to be color coded. Um, or if you're looking at this online uh, the original PDF document has the color coding there, okay? If you don't have that and you're just listening to the podcast, well, then just follow along that way. Listen up. Trusting faithfulness when compared in a nuanced sense to faith. Just listen for a moment, okay? Faith seems to imply, now this is just my own opinion, but it's shared by David Stern, or I should say it's David Stern's opinion and I share it. Faith seems to imply a one-time action on our part which forever sets into motion a spiritual truth that will be fully actualized at the return of our Lord. Okay? If you ask your average person, and in this case you don't even have to be a Christian, because you, you know, there are religious people everywhere you, everywhere you go, you can meet religious people. So you ask a religious person, do you have faith? And, and the, the typical response seems to imply this particular candor. Okay? Notice the phrase, I place my trust in Jesus, or I place my trust in in Yeshua, okay? It sounds so static. And and on the one hand, the moment you got saved was a monumental event. Baruch Hashem. And I'm, t- I'm not trying to minimize that. But what I mean is, is when we say I trusted in, I, I, I put my trust in Jesus, or I, I placed my trust in Yeshua, it sounds so dated. It sounds like it's in something that took place, especially if you're speaking to someone who's a little older. It sounds like something that happened you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and it doesn't seem to have any ongoing relevance for their lives. Now again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is true of everyone. I'm just saying that there, there seems to be that, that, uh, uh, that, that hint when I hear this, con- this in c- average conversation. This is, maybe it's just me, all right? Notice again the candor of the phrase, I place my trust in Yeshua. However, let's compare it now to trusting faithfulness because what we've done is we did, we've, taste, we've taken um, a noun and we've uh, uh, added a little bit of a verb to it. The former phrase, trusting faithfulness, carries the aspect of a daily motion which permeates every movement of our new creation lives. Listen to the phrase now. I place my trusting faithfulness in Yeshua. Faithfulness. Trusting faithfulness. The, mod- the word faithfulness is modified by the word trusting. Okay? Now, do you notice the subtle difference between the two phrases? I know some of you are going, gosh, Ariel, you're grasping at straws. Just don't tune me out just yet, okay? Trusting faithfulness. All right? To live by trusting faithfulness rather than just by faith alone, okay? It seems, and again to me, and it, apparently it seemed this way to David Stern, and later on we're going to find out it seems this way to, to Tim Haig as well, but trusting faithfulness rather than just faith 
characterizes our moment-by-moment -moment thought process as well as our actions. In other words, I'm, I'm motivated and driven by, by an active uh, um, relationship with God, not, not a passive relationship with God. Um, trusting faithfulness seems to transform our faith into action. That's why it's called trusting faithfulness. In other words, this new life in Messiah, as a saved person, it's an ever-constant, ever-growing relationship with the Holy One of Israel. What it is, is it's a demonstration of the miraculous on a level that can and should be measured even in the smallest areas of our lives. That's trusting faithfulness, people. And it needs to be a dynamic quality of our life. That's really the nuance that I'm trying to portray when I use the word faith versus or when compared to the word trusting faithfulness. I'm trying to give this dynamic quality to our faith. Our faith needs to be dynamic. It needs to be ongoing. It needs to be moving. It needs to be growing. It needs to be, to be changing. It needs to be challenged. Okay? Trusting faithfulness is ongoing. That's my point. It's not some, some uh, 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 unmoving, monumental event which took place sometime in our lives. Although, don't get me wrong, the moment you... I mean, I, I know people who can name the day, the hour, the second when they got saved. That's great. I think that's great. That's not what I'm trying to minimize. Don't, don't misunderstand me. What I'm trying to say is, you got saved 20 years ago. Great. Are you still living for God today? That's my question. That's where I'm going with this conversation. Are you still living for God today? The, can, it, is, can it be seen in, ju in, in everything that you do that, 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 that Christ is the center of your life? Now, I know we fail from time to time. We all do. We have our ups. We have our downs. But the life of a Christian, the life of a believer, the life of a son of God, is someone, it's a lifestyle that should be characterized by the Spirit's activity on even the smallest level. Okay? F uh, trusting faithfulness, as, as I'm describing it, is the ongoing monumental process that overtakes our lives for how long? Not just once, not twice, but for the rest of our lives. And it was enacted when? When we first had a genuine encounter with the Divine Holiness. It's that simple, if I can use that term simple. Okay? Saved is an ongoing lifestyle. I'm not just saved and then, you know, I wasn't just saved 20 years ago and now I'm somehow living my life devoid of, of any salvation power. Every day I need to surrender to Yeshua. Every day I need to crucify the flesh. Every day I need to be pressing closer in in my relationship to God, in my walk with God, in my study of Torah, in my service to others. Every day I must maintain my relationship with God. Every day I must avail myself of the Spirit's power so that I can, in fact, uh, 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 be, the, be the, the, the person I'm supposed to be in the community that I'm placed in. God tells me, love your neighbor, Ariel. Love your neighbor. The second greatest commandment. How can I love my neighbor under my own power? It's not possible. It's not possible. And God doesn't expect me to do so. No, what the Torah expects of me once God's Spirit has taken up residence within me and His words have been given to me, what God expects me to do is to avail myself of His Spirit and of His words to walk into the mitzvah that says, Love your neighbor. That's what it takes. And so that's why being saved, that's why trusting faithfulness is an ongoing process. And guess what? I should not be getting worse at it from day to day as time goes by. I should be getting better at it. Why? Because the Spirit is working with me to do it. Now allow me to elaborate on this concept further using a quote from author Tim Haig. All right, of course, Tim Haig is one of my favorites. He's also one of the teachers at Congregation Beit Hallel in Tacoma, Washington. And he's also a significant contributor of the materials of First Fruits of Zion publications, FFOZ. So in his excellent work, about the Apostle Paul, entitled The Letter Writer. Haig wrote in the prologue, and I want to I pull the quote from his prologue here, um, because it's an important note regarding the original languages of the Bible and how we should be able to interact with this concept of faith and faithfulness. All right, listen up. I think you're going to be um, uh, um, 
I think you're going to be fascinated by this next quote. All right, we're in the middle of page four. Quote, one of the major difficulties we encounter in our discussion of trust, of course he's speaking of believers, right? Uh, in our discussion of trust, believe, and faith or faithful, is that there's no corresponding verbal form of faith in the English language. All right? What he means is, we have no way of saying that one faithed, or that someone is faithing in God. You ever ask, let me just pause there. You ever, you ever ask someone that question? Go up, go up to your pastor. Try this, try this trick on your pastor uh, next time you see him, okay? Him or her. Go up, to him, go up to him and say, Pastor, do you have faith? Of course, let him think about it for a moment. He's going to think it's a trick question. It is. Pastor, do you have faith? And let's, uh, let's assume he responds yes. I hope he responds yes. He responds yes. Yes, I have faith. Then pause for effect and look at him and say, When's the last time you faithed? F-A-I-T-H-E-D, faithed. You took a noun and turned it into a verb. See how that works? Okay. We don't have an English course. We, we don't have an English equivalent of that, you know? Are you guys faithing today? F-A-I-T-H-I-N-G. That's what Haig's trying to say here, all right? Yet, the fascinating insight as I go back to Haig here is that in both the Hebrew and in the Greek, the word group expressing the concept of faith also, the noun, also contains a verb built on the same root. Now, those of you who have taken Hebrew or Greek know that these words are built on root systems. Hebrew has a root system whereby we derive other cognates of these same words. And the root, um, it usually gives us our meaning for the word, and then the cognates or the, 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 um, the conjugations of these words um, are all related to this initial root. Heg goes on to say, to put it simply, noun and verb are cognate. In Hebrew and in Greek, okay, Greek, they both they, they they work off of each other. For example, and here's the example he gives: the Hebrew verb aman, a m a n, the Hebrew verb aman, which means to be supported, okay, from which we derive the verb to believe. All right, the Hebrew verb aman has the corresponding noun emuna, which means faith or faithful. See the relationship between the two. From the verb aman, we get the noun emunah. From believe, we go to faith or faithful. Now, likewise, the Greek verb pistuo, which means to believe, the verb pistuo, has the corresponding noun pistis, which means faith or faithful. So the relationship between pistuo and pistis, the verb and the noun. Now, unfortunately, Haig goes on to, con uh, to comment, many English readers do not realize that, quote, believing and having faith and being faithful, end quote, all derive from the same word group, whether in the Hebrew or in the Greek. In other words, in the Hebrew and the Greek, when you're talking about the verb and the noun, they, they stem from the same word group. There's an association there. Now, this has all but been lost on our modern-day religious communities, unfortunately. Faith, again, this is, this is basically a restating of what I said earlier up in my commentary. The word faith, in most Christian settings, and again, I'm not just picking on Christians, but since the majority of my listening audience is Christians, I'm focusing my energies in this area, okay? The challenge is, is, is being presented to your average Christian listener of my podcast today. I really wish many, many more um, non believing or non-Messianic Jews would listen to my podcast, the challenge is there as well, okay? And the challenge is for me, so don't, don't feel like I'm picking on you, all right? But anyway, faith is considered almost exclusively to mean that one is, quote, convinced, end quote, of this or that without regard to any outward action. Okay, let me just pause and illustrate. Typically, if you ask someone if they have faith, they'll say yes. And then if you ask them to describe their faith, they'll start rattling off a set of beliefs, a set of um, maxims, a set of... Um, what do we say, creeds or whatnot. You know, I believe this, I believe that, I believe this. And it really shouldn't stop there. I'm not saying that creeds are wrong. I'm not saying that maxims are incorrect. I think we should know what we believe. However, the challenge here, and I'll just let Haig uh, continue, the challenge is this. Yet the very words used by the authors of Scripture indicate that this was not their meaning. What both the Hebrew and the Greek words word groups tell us plainly is that the internal mental activity of genuine faith always shows itself in outward obedience okay there's the challenge internal faith will always result in outward faithfulness 
Faith and faithfulness are bound together as two sides of the same coin. The noun and the verb work together. They are one coin with two sides. The verb on one side, the noun on the other side. Faith on one side and faithfulness on the other side. Um, Haig goes on to conclude, This division in the Western world view of the internal, which is called faith, from the external, which is called faithfulness, is foreign to the biblical way of looking at things. Why? Because it is foreign to a Hebrew understanding of faith and faithfulness. And since the Bible was written by Hebrews, not moderns, not Westerners, but by Hebrews, and those who'd come to adopt the Hebrew way of looking at the world, it only makes sense that the biblical teaching on faith would flow from a Hebraic perspective, end quote. And if you look at the bottom of page 5, you'll see this footnote was taken from Tim Haig, the letter writer, Paul's background, and the Torah perspective, FFOZ Publications, 2002, pages 17 through 19, and then also page 21. Are you beginning to understand what we're getting at here? The Torah expects faith. There is a regeneration from the inside. God's Spirit writes His laws on the heart of a circumcised individual. When I say circumcised there, I mean a, a, a circumcision of the heart. But once the transformation is complete, once, once the, um, the heart is circumcised, once the person has surrendered to the Spirit of God, that's when the fun begins. Because from that moment forward, the Spirit of God and the individual work in concert to bring about a righteous behavior in the life of the individual. Are you beginning to see it now? That this concept is firmly rooted in the Torah proper is paramount to understanding such writings themselves. We've got to understand as we read through the Torah, as we read through Paul's writings, remember how I warned earlier on at the beginning of my parasha that this is, this is, proper, this is going to be a proper hermeneutic to understanding Paul's writings? We can't read through Paul's writings and think that he's just um, upset with Israel for walking in the Torah. Paul's trying to get his readers to understand that the transformation first starts on the inside. And so that's why he went to great pains to explain how that Yeshua is the central feature of the Torah and that all of the Torah points towards the Messiah's coming, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his intercession. The Torah anticipates that the person who's reading the Torah is going to surrender to the God who wrote the Torah, surrender to the Messiah found therein, accept the Spirit of God, and then to an about face and turn around and continue to walk into the very words of the Torah. That's my point. Paul understood that. And so, um, when we read through the Torah and we see God expecting covenant faithfulness of the members, when he's asking Israel, walk in my ways, Israel, obey my commandments, keep my precepts, uh, observe my statutes and my judgments, God is not merely asking them to walk into his Torah under, his own, under their own power. God understands that the Torah cannot be properly walked out unless it's by the Spirit of God. And that's why the Spirit of God has been given. That's why God has made his Spirit available to every man who names the name of the Word of God, which of course in Tanakh times we didn't know him as Yeshua, but he was the Messiah to come. Now that he has come, we do know his name, it is Yeshua, and we can claim his name as uh, uh, the, the, the right relationship with God. Therefore, when it comes to walking in the Torah, what's the problem? What's the problem? There is no problem. We walk into Torah. In fact, to use Paul's own words, he says, and I'll just turn to it. Let me pull it up out of the KJV before I'm getting ahead of myself. This is a great posic, this great verse here. Um, and I wish more churches would look at this verse and just preach on it. Um, in... Um, in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, I'm sorry, in uh, verse uh, uh, 31, there's a whole other midrash it's starting at verse 28, but in Romans 3, 31, it says, quote, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. In other words, the Torah understands that once you accept Yeshua as your Messiah, then the Torah is meant to be walked out. It's what I say in the opening part of my commentaries. Or, I'm sorry, I say at the end of my commentaries. Now that the Messiah has come, the Torah is a document meant to be walked out under the power of the Holy Spirit. Quite, quite simply. So going back to this idea of faith and faithfulness, right? Can we expect to find these concepts of faith and trusting faithfulness working in tandem, played out in the writings of the Renewed Covenant? Again, 
the Torah understands this. The Torah anticipates this. God built it into the Torah itself. That God is asking Israel to walk into his ways and walk into his words under the power of the Spirit needs to be understood by uh, we the readers. We need to understand that when we're reading uh, the words, for instance, in today's parasha, where God says, because, remember the parasha is named Ekev, uh, because you have done these things, I will do these things for you. Are we going to see the unified voice in um, in the New Testament? Well, of course we are. I already read verse 31 of Romans 3, but now let me just back up a little bit and get a running start and just develop the context. Okay, observe um, Paul's conclusion in verse 31, but let me start in verse 21, 10 verses earlier, and move into verse 31. Keep in mind that this whole um, commentary to Romans is Paul's warning, I should say, to Gentile believers not to become boastful against the supporting root of the olive tree that they have been grafted into. And this olive tree is a, is a, is a Judaic family, okay, if I could use... Um, ethnic markers to, to, to explain it. I say this at the beginning of my comment, or no, I, I guess I say it, it's either at the end or the beginning, I, I, I can't remember. It's in the tagline, right? I say something like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, I'm, I'm glad that you've, uh, um, that you are interested in the Jewish root that supports you, okay? Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, becomes aware that the Gentile church, the Gentile set, the Gentile believers, is going to eventually feel as if they have outgrown their Jewish counterparts and that they no longer need the support from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as it were. And so Paul gives them an advance warning in Romans chapter um, 11. Actually, it starts in chapter 9 and it goes through chapter 10 and into chapter 11, culminating with this famous all of tree, all of tree theology. But way back here in chapter 3, we can see already how Paul is explaining to both Jew and Gentile alike, both believers, that, that ethnicity or one's family lineage bears no relevance when it comes to God making a person righteous. And it also, I might add, bears no relevance when it comes to walking in the Torah. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, you're equally unrighteous before you come to Messiah. And once you come to Messiah, whether you're Jew or Gentile, it does not matter. The Torah is equally your covenant position. So let me just read these verses, and then uh, I'll have some concluding thoughts, and we'll just close this commentary down right now, okay? We're on the top of page 5, starting with verse 21 of Romans chapter 3 out of the New International Version. And I made some emphasis and some cosmetic changes, alright? What I did is I inserted the word Torah in a few places. I inserted the word Yeshua the Messiah instead of Jesus Christ, okay? Here we go, verse 21, quote, This is Paul, But now a righteousness from God apart from Torah has been made known to which the Torah and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Yeshua the Messiah to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Yeshua the Messiah. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who... And, I'm sorry, let me read that, that verse again, verse 26. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Yeshua. Verse 27, where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of legalistically observing the Torah? No but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from legalistically observing the Torah. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith, do we then nullify the Torah by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the Torah. End quote. Did you see it there, people? The first century Judaisms, first of all, did not think that they were supposed to walk into the Torah to obtain covenant membership or forensic righteousness. That's a mistake on the part of later Christian authors who believe that 
Israel simplistically constructed uh, constructed uh, a ladder to heaven that was um, um, comprised of doing the commandments rotely or routinely X Y Z. You know, if I just do X Y Z, God will let me into heaven, or if I do X Y Z, God will make me a covenant member. That mistaken notion. Of course, we know the theology is wrong. But to suppose that that's what Israel taught in the first century is also inaccurate. And that's why I allowed my um, version here to say in, for instance, verse 28, uh, Paul to say, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from legalistic, legalistically observing the Torah. I left it um, worded that way, even though the, the, the original translation just says, it doesn't say legalistically there. That's, I've kind of um, picked it up from David Stern. It's because many, again, many churches are purporting that Israel of the first century um, simplistically believed that they could keep the Torah, again, simplistically, without love for God, without love for man, without help from the Spirit. Uh, many Christians, or many churches supposedly teach that the, uh, I'm sorry, let me say it this way. Many Christian churches teach that first century Israel supposedly believes in the simplistic ladder to heaven. Or, or we, could, we could term it... Um, um, merit theology. Many Christians uh, believe that Israel of the first century believed in merit theology. And that's where we have the simplistic ladder to heaven. But in order to understand Paul's writings accurately, I have to tell you that merit theology not only is theologically inaccurate, we already know that part, but also it's historically inaccurate to, to place that um, place that uh, 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 ideal or that, that program in in the hands of first century Israel. They did not believe that the Torah saved them or brought them covenant membership. What they believed, which is still inaccurate, but let me just tell you what they did believe. They believed that, that by virtue of being Jewish alone earned them covenant membership and consequently earned them a place in the world to come. In other words, their faith was not in their works. Their faith was in their identity. Now either way, it's misguided faith. It's going to fail them. Faith in your works or faith in your identity is still going to fail when it comes to God's standard of righteousness, specifically how God declares a person righteous through Messiah. Only by faith in Messiah, only by surrendering to the righteousness of Messiah, can a person expect to receive the free gift that God authors, namely faith or namely righteousness. God does not declare a person righteous by their works. And God does not declare a person righteous by their identity. And so what we need to do as we study Paul's writings is understand that Paul is not combating merit theology so much as Paul is combating mistaken identity. Okay? Let me just uh, turn to the top of page 6 on my commentary and draw this to a close. Okay? Far from teaching that a righteous status is obtained through legalistically following the Torah or, as in the case of first century Israel, a belief that righteousness is automatically granted on the basis of being born Jewish or converting to Judaism, if you weren't born Jewish. The unified word of God teaches that as believers and children of the Most High God, that we uphold His righteous standard. Why? Because we are already righteous in His sight. In other words, for those of you who aren't catching it, let me just say it plainly this way. Why do we keep the Torah now that we have come to faith in Messiah? Why do we continue to walk into the commandments of Moses now that we've already been saved? It's a big question from the Christian church side of the house. They scratch their heads and can't figure out why we Messianics are keeping the Torah even though we believe in Jesus. Well, let me answer the question. We don't keep the Torah to become saved. We keep the Torah because we're saved. And why do we keep the Torah? Because it is the righteous standard of God. It is covenant faithfulness. It is the maintenance of the covenant that God commanded that we do. And he realizes, God himself, he realizes that the only true way to walk into the covenant and to be faithful to it is from a regenerated heart, a circumcised heart, can and will keep the commandments of God. It could not be stated clearer. 
This idea of commandment keeping is a state of mind as well as a daily function. It's on the inside first, people. We should never, ever fall for the age-old compulsory reasons for keeping the commandments of God. Okay? Legalism. That is, keeping the Torah for the sake of either salvation or to ostensibly improve our status with Hashem and receive special favor from God. This is not scriptural. And this is not the reason we should be keeping the Torah. To be sure, it's a misuse of Torah itself. If that's what you're doing, I urge you to stop. I urge you to re-examine why you're walking into the Torah. Okay? I'll just close with this statement. Torah observance is a matter of the heart. It is a natural action of ours, urged on and empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit within us. It is the result, it, Torah observance, is the result from having the Torah placed on our inward parts as new creations in Messiah Yeshua. Uh, reference Jeremiah 31.31. 31, 31. Reference Joel. Reference Ezekiel, where God says, I'm going to place my laws on their inward parts. Reference Hebrews chapter 8. Reference Hebrews chapter 10, which is quoting the Jeremiah passage. All right? Torah observance is not something we do to become saved. Torah observance is something we do because we are saved. Amen? Amen. With that, I'll close my commentary. The closing blessing is as follows. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher natan lanu Torah met vechaye olam nata batochinu Baruch atah Adonai notein HaTorah Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have given us your Torah of truth and it planted everlasting life within our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And with that, I bid you a hearty Shabbat Shalom. That concludes our show for today. Remember, because the Messiah has already come, the Torah is now a document meant to be lived out in the life of a faithful follower of Yeshua through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh to the glory of God the Father. It should not be presumed that it can be obeyed mechanically, automatically, legalistically, without having faith, without having trust in Hashem, without having love for God or man, and without being empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh. To state it succinctly, Torah observance is a matter of the heart, always has been, and always will be. My name is Torah teacher Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. The intro and outro song was produced and performed by Ryan Kingsley. For information on contacting Ryan, you can reach me by email at yeshua613 at hotmail.com. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A number 613 at hotmail.com. Or visit our website at graftedin.com. That's graftedin.com.